founders fabricated their national identity was not much different from the way Italians or Americans did it in the previous century. Myths, flags, anthems, and monuments. So why did it turn out so nasty here? Well, remember that all these identities are quite artificial. Families are real, clans are real, but larger groups, tribes and nations, are always a kind of fiction. And it's a hard fiction to maintain. That's why we all live our lives submerged in nationalist propaganda of one kind or another. They were told by their religious leaders that they are the chosen people. These basically good people, because all people are basically good, were huddled into a little corner where they started believing in, in this extremist, xenophobic kind of ideology. In a sense, in a sense, like Nazi Germany. And that's where things went utterly and completely wrong. The policy of separate development of the National Party is not and has never been a denial of human values or human rights. On the contrary, it has created separate facilities for each racial group to enjoy. And nobody will be allowed to touch or to take away that which belongs to us. The National Party took power in 1948. And for the next 40 years, three million Afrikaners exercised total control over a country of 40 million people. It was an awesome demonstration of the sheer power of tribalism. If human beings were as bloody-minded as they sometimes seem, Durban Harbor would have been a war zone by 1993. It was not, and one of the main reasons was sanctions. Beginning in the 1960s, other countries put restrictions on trade with South Africa. Apartheid was just too offensive to the ideas of equality and justice that were gaining ground elsewhere. Sanctions crippled South Africa's economy and created huge unemployment among blacks. But sanctions did work in the end, and the reasons they succeeded are very encouraging. They worked because enough people elsewhere cared about human rights in South Africa and got the sanctions imposed in the first place. And they worked because when the system finally cracked, enough people here believed in equality too and worked day and night to stop the transition from collapsing into a tribal and racial power struggle. The concept of equal rights has taken root in the most unlikely soil. Tribalists always try to control education, and Pearlie Hubert got the full treatment. She was born in the Western Cape, a thousand kilometers from Johannesburg, and she went to Stellenbosch, a conservative Afrikaans university. But by the late 80s, it was obvious that something was wrong. I mean, there wasn't anything like major that made me realize, fuck, I'm sitting here riding my bicycle, go and listen to esoteric things like Wittgenstein lying in the trenches, writing the Tractatus. Sort of come in, you see people living like pigs in Kaimandi. The colored students on campus, the little group of them, they had, a, they had one hostel way off campus, only one. And they couldn't st stay in town because of the Group Areas Act. The ANC was still illegal in South Africa, and its ideas about a non-tribal democracy were banned in the schools. But when the kids grew up, they were ambushed by reality. I remember the one thing that really, really made me the most violently angry was to discover how many people lied to me, like in terms of learning history. We never, ever, ever learned one thing about the ANC. It was as though it wasn't there. And then you think back of sitting in school for 12 years and, and taking history as a subject. And then you just think, how could they? How could they lie to this extent to, to, to us? 
Purley was drawn into the protest movement, and eventually, inevitably, she was arrested. As the police jumped out, they sort of lined up in front of us. And then the guy that, that landed up right in front of me was at school with me for 12 years. And his nickname used to be Bullet. And we were, we were wearing T-shirts with Margaret Reiters, the woman that got shot, with her face on. And then in the back was saying, Bullets won't stop us. And Bullet was standing here with a cork gun right in front of me. That was horrible. Ooh, that was absolutely horrible. Because I just got this impression of us sitting together at school and then what happened? That, you, that I'm here and you here in a police uniform aiming a gun at Pumi and me and Leslie and whoever. It caused quite a stir. But it's interesting. I, I did get some support of some of my friends. You know, Annalie sort of, Newbear, Pearlie's um, mother, was a school teacher at the don't time. Don't worry. She'll get over it all. Patronizing. Yes, but not all. Some of them were quite nice. This, I remember um, Umvali. He's an old man. He's a friend of my father. It was so surprising when he told me, you know, only the students will teach us something. And he was quite an old man already. I, I really... Did he say that to you? Yes. <laughs> but I must say in the school, there was an island of silence around me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really thought oh, she'll get into trouble. What is she doing? Shouldn't she just leave and go on with her studies? Uh, but really mixed feelings, you know, and I, sometimes I thought, damn it, I wish I could join her, you know. Pearlie has come home to the wine country of the Western Cape to cover the saddest, strangest tribal story of all. Because the people around here are all related in a way. Curly grew up in a family that spoke Afrikaans, belonged to the Dutch Reformed Church, thought of themselves as whites. But there was a great deal of mixing between the races in the early days. Several million darker descendants of that mixing, the so-called coloreds, speak Afrikaans and practice the same brand of Christianity. But the white Afrikaners froze the coloreds out right from the start. And when the National Party brought in apartheid, one of its first acts was to take the vote away from colored people. Now, however, South Africa is becoming a non-racial democracy. State support for the Afrikaans language and culture will depend on how many people want it. So now, Afrikaner politicians want colored votes. And they're very sorry about the past. Racism breeds racism, and up in Johannesburg, there's a lot less forgiveness. Wally Mbele has just managed to locate and interview an Apple gunman. Uh, Mr. Toboti, I'm going to run a story based on an interview with an Apple operative. Apple, the Azanian People's Liberation Army, is the underground terrorist wing of the Pan-Africanist Congress. The Pan-Africanist Congress defines all South African whites as settlers, and its favorite slogan is, one settler, one bullet. No, we cannot answer that question. That is a very sensitive question. You uh -huh. must bear one thing in mind. We are in the struggle. Uh -huh. Then when you are in the struggle, mm -hmm. you must be very careful of what you are saying. I see. You must bear one thing in mind. Mm. PAC is not just an ordinary political organization. Mm. It is not a bourgeois organization. Mm. It is a revolutionary party. Mm -hmm. And then in a revolutionary party, people die. Yeah. Yes, people get hanged. Yeah. I hope you do understand what I'm saying. Uh. You know, my brother, don't ask me the, the question of policemen. I'm not expecting that to come from an African. And we better get a story cooked up for when the police come and question you. They're going to say, Mr. Mbele, you aided and abetted a terrorist. <laughs> Why didn't you inform us this is a criminal offense? The uh, Apla guy comes to us. Our duty is to inform the public what he says, who he is, and he does, what he's planning. Yeah. We are not in the business of catching Apla and delivering him to the police. I mean, the most dangerous thing we can do is to have anything to do with giving them information which could lead to the arrest of someone. It's suicide. It's suicide for any journalist. They, they are going to try and force us to reveal the source. 
Because that would amount to being a police informer. No, 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 there's no way. Yeah. Uh, we're just stating what the citizens of the country, this country should know. Mm. That there's an army loose and there's no political control over them. If, if they need people to come and drain them, they, they yeah. need to be open to the people and tell the people who, are they, who they are. Yeah. What yeah. are they doing for them? But people are entitled to know. Because Atla is fighting in the name of African people in this country. Mm. So how come African people aren't entitled to know who they are? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? What is their agenda? What is their political uh, uh, manifesto? Mm -hmm. so I don't think we need to feel guilty for any, in any way if we're even going to nail the PAC and say, what is going on here? And what the fuck are you guys about? You're killing people on our behalf. What does it mean? It's never been anything like this. Write it to the fullest detail and atmosphere and impressions. It's, it's rather unique for us, for anybody to talk to an Apple soldier. The police did come round, but the paper took the precaution of sending Wally out of town on a story. And if Apple came looking for him, they missed him. When you look at all the armies and police and cherished beliefs that back up the tribes, they can seem unbeatable, eternal. But of course they're not. The ethnic and national identities that seem to be such fixed boundaries are really just raindrops running down a window pane. My ancestors were Irish, I was born Canadian, my sons are English, and who knows what their kids will be. Once you get beyond the instinctive territory of the clan, it's all artificial anyway. It will take generations to heal the scars of apartheid. And elsewhere, from the ethnic cleansing in Rwanda and Bosnia to the routine nationalism of places like Russia and America, the old tribal reflex is still alive and kicking. And yet, what made people see the old South Africa as the skunk of the world was a global shift towards equality and democracy. And it hasn't just forced change here, over two-thirds of the human race now lives in more or less democratic countries. The glass is not half empty. It is half full. At the basis of the fear of today is they're going to do to us what we did to them. The hard part is for those arrogant white European racists to say, we will serve under a black government and our president is going to be black and he's going to be an African and we will respect him for it and we will forget that our pigmentation is white and we will forget where, we, where our ancestors came from. I think that process is happening already. I'm certainly, the people here see themselves as Africans and not as Europeans or whatever. We are white Africans. And I think that is the process that is going to be amazing. Uh, that will be a lesson for all of us in the world. But the, the questions of a redistribution of power, a redistribution of economic power, a redistribution of wealth, a redistribution of land, those are the real tricky ones. Wally Mbele was sent off to talk to Afrikaner farmers about the price of change. And in Harry Smith, he found one who had actually joined the African National Congress, Cassiou Man. He went further than that. He's now going to the townships, organizing for the ANC, preparing the ANC for the forthcoming elections in those townships. That is very much extraordinary to me. Long live Comrade Ronisata Mandela, long live. Long live People's Alliance, long live. Amanda! Ah! Cass Human was the first Afrikaner farmer in the Orange Free State to join the ANC. Better living, so that we can have the chance to elect the government of our choice, so that you can vote the people into government that you want there to be. Think about who is the leaders of this town. Responsible people where this Bafana can look up to and say hi.